what I think is the most overlooked part of painting Warhammer, prep. I think the combination of those really good Japanese made clippers that we always bang on about, a quick demold one with my blunt knife, and then Tamiya sanding foam, that for me is a process of getting rid of screw joints or mold lines. You know, I'm deciding I'm going to use this off the wall colour combination or this colour that I've never used before, but I'm planning it first. I fear spending like 20 minutes setting up a plan and then I've got this great idea in my head of because I'm theorising basically what I'm going to do and then I put the brush on the model and instantly it's wrong. Right. You actually triggered this on one of the previous episodes where we all showed off our paint. Everyone has been asking me about the dropper <laughs> bottles. Honestly, like, yeah, including me. I've still been... Even I've Joe's been, like... been harassing me. <laughs> like, oh, when are you going to give me, like, when are you going to give me the up for the dropper bottles? Because he told me, you told me about it, but then didn't give me the link until recently. Right. Viejo 70095. That is the product name, yeah. number, for seven... 17 milliliters, not 15, not 20, 17 milliliters. That is the size of the empty dropper bottles. Look online, find a retailer of your choice. Someone's bound so to have the them. It's the official Vallejo ones. Is that right? Yeah. It used to, I feel like when I used to buy them like two, two odd years ago, they used to always have like the actual Vallejo like branding on like the photo. Yeah. Now they're kind of like ducked away with that. I'm not sure what the score is with supply. Regardless, look that up. You'll find them. Usually I'll pay between like 20 to 40p a bottle, um, but I'm in bulk. So there we yeah. go. That's where you that's where people whenever you like search online for like dropper bottles, it's easy to be like, oh, these like look the same. The size, if you want them to like fit in like a normal like paint rack, like everyone, most of the miniature painting uh, dropper bottles tend to be 17 milliliters, which I guess is not like a standard outside of our industry. Um, so that's even where, if yeah, if you go on Amazon and just look for dropper bottles, you end up either getting fifteen or twenty, yeah, or twenty five. Uh, are we yeah. going to be providing any links to anybody? To be no, you have to find them yourself because no. it changes They're so all often. Over. It yeah. depends on country yeah. you're in as well. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Fair. Get your snips, cut the lid off, pour it all into the new one. You might lose a tiny bit of paint at the end of the day. It's not really going to make a difference. Good time to add an agitator ball if you're so inclined. That's it. Yeah, seven zero zero nine five. 17 milliliters. See how those product codes are important? Yeah, you yeah, like you them were, now, didn't you? You, you? Were, you were, you were bash, I, bashing you, on yeah. them last time. Yeah. Well, in fairness, I'm not the one who's looking for the dropper bottles. I was out there grafting, <laughs> researching dropper bottles for years <laughs> until I found these, all right? I'm doing, I'm doing the work for you, all right? Yeah, cool. That's all sorted then. Let's put that to bed. Yeah. Right. What's been, uh, what's been going on this week, guys? I Obviously, we are, unfortunately, we are pre-recording this episode because uh, I'm away next week. George has uh, been selfish and so I take a week off. So I'm 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 out on a hunt for more hobby products. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, this is pre-recorded. So if you're watching, you haven't clicked on last week's by accident, it just looks exactly the same. Just so you know. Um what has been going what else has been going on? Oh the uh, war boot. Oh yeah, war boot. Yes, I I uh I, I had a um I run basically a, a wargaming boot sale uh, here in Essex with uh, with another chap called Sam. Um, so yeah, war boot was something that I, I, you know, I I used to go boot sales when I was a kid. I used to see Warhammer and stuff like that, you know. Um, and I just thought, you know, like, why, why, why is there not a dedicated wargaming boot sale? The yeah. thrill of the hunt. I know the thrill of the hunt. Admittedly, like you know, um, I, I I I probably don't need any more grey shame. Being honest. Um, but we didn't get any grey shame at last World Boot because they were already painted the ones that you bought. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so they're not grey. Technically, no, they're not grey. Technically, yeah. I guess pewter is silver. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It still counts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, World Boot is uh, is just uh, an Essex boot sale that happens every uh, three months um, in Billericay, just at Barleylands, which is a, a little farm uh, just near uh, near Billericay. Uh, and yeah, we get, we have a, a load of traders that come down, people that want to you know shift some of their gray shame or that want to, you know, uh, part with sort of collections and bits and bobs, uh, which is quite good, um, for, for sort of like my hunt for nostalgia, like it's always, it's always good. You always find someone selling some, some good items. You know, I, I managed to pick up two boxes of more than nine guard this weekend. So that's quite, I was quite happy with that. Um, what year was that? We were trying to work out what year they were. I can't we? remember. They're red box. So they're like 90. 
They're like 96 or something. Like yeah, five. yeah bro, so you get some, yeah, you get some yeah. proper hidden gems then. There is quite a lot of hidden gems, the, yeah. The Necron thing was cool. Yeah, the ne- a, uh, I didn't, we didn't get it in the end, you know. Uh, oh, what, the, no. oh, the, Necron, oh, the blister, no. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, no, not the other Necron no, there was thing. No, there was a giant Necron head so you, that we were going to get. you run a boot sale yeah. and you spent the entire time shopping at the boot sale that you run. Yeah, Paul, Paul is on the stall. Yeah. James so this is all just a ruse so that James can bring all of the second end marines to him. Pretty much, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, but the, everyone else yeah. benefits from it. Everyone so else benefits because they get get to get rid of their their grey shame or their, their models and things that they don't well, want. But you get to, you get some really good gems there, like you do. Like there's loads of old books. There's loads of uh, like you always have someone that has the like, Necron thing that I just brought out was the the white dwarf. Yeah. So so I so there was uh it was a trader that was selling um a load of sealed blisters like second ed uh, onwards blisters like the old blister packs, um and on their rack I spotted one that uh. All the blisters have like a bit of a, a bit of a, they stick out quite far from the cardboard, it's like and it's a ridge, isn't it? It's like a ridge, yeah. yeah it's got like a like it slopes a, out, a slopes like out, a classic kind of, like a I don't know how to action explain. figure. Yeah, like a, yeah. Thing. Uh, and they had a Necron Warrior in a, a blister, but it was a real flat, um, flat sort of really close fitting blister, like the bubble of the plastic. And immediately, I recognised what it was. So when Necrons were very first released, long, 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 long time ago. On the front of White Dwarf, GW gave away a metal Necron Warrior on the front of that month's White Dwarf. And obviously, because they're stacking these magazines in boxes or whatever, you can't have like a ridged blister. So they had a blister that was a lot flatter and closer fitting um, just to fit the the open pose Necron Warrior that they gave away. Um, and I, yeah, I found one of those blisters, you know, that nothing, you know, it's not super, it's not super rare or anything, I suppose, but like, it's just, I, maybe, it's a cool maybe, find. Yeah, though, it's a cool little, it? cool little find. I, like, I've got to say, like, someone with no skin in the game, I don't run Warboot, I'm not anything to do with Warboot. I've been to two of, two of them now, went to the first one, and I went to that most recent one. And like, it's very good. It's, it's like, when you were explaining the idea at first, when, when you were going to start to do it, and I, and I thought, like, but there's going to be like 10 people turn up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, what? There's, surely there isn't enough interest in it, in our little toy soldier. To drive people there. to Essex of all places. Yeah. yeah. L- literally. We, we, like, we, that first one we had was over 300 insane. people turn up. Yeah. 300 people yeah. through the day. Yeah. Like, it's only, it was only like three hours, four hours long. Like a, like a normal, but do you know like what's cool sale. about it? Like aside from the boot sale thing, I didn't. I went on Sunday. I didn't buy anything at the boot sale. I ended up. I spent my money in Sam's shop instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On the way out. Um, uh, but do you know what's cool is because it's at um, Barley Lands, which is like a craft village. It's a farm park as well. There's an, an actual boot sale going on over the other side of the car park. There's like quite once you're out of war boot and you've done your thing or whatever there's quite a there's like a little cafe and stuff so it's like quite a big area for people to just hang out and you end up like it's like all the warhammer nerds take over barley lands for the day like like everyone's it's just a cool i, I think i spoke before about how like on the gaming side of the hobby you have social events are yeah. built into gaming like it is part of the thing but on the painting side, you don't necessarily have as many social events. You have painting competitions, yeah, yeah. but they're few and far between. And this is, it's like one of those, because albeit, obviously a lot of people there are gaming as well. Um, it does get a lot of the painters together to like go through all these, look at these old models and stuff. And it gets, it's cool. It was cool just as like a little social yeah. thing it's as well. Is it really good? Because you've got like uh, the, the cafe there that's run by, a, they make jam, they make, gin they make loads of stuff you know uh, they the cafe is really cool the cafe's great yeah. yeah um but yeah like you know so so we you know it's something that i do want to grow uh you know I th- you know i think there's there's I, i've I noticed there's other other sort of boot sales and things cropping up which is great you know i think it's something that again in our industry um is something that hasn't been there you know and it's nice to have that now as part of the industry and i just didn't events. think that there'd be enough interest Everyone's got loads of grey shame, Joe. Of course, they're going to want to get. Yeah, but I think it's, yeah. it's, it's like a, it's yeah. like an exchange of grey shame, though, because you've got yeah. people going there to buy stuff. Yeah. Also got yeah. too much uh, and we're like, when when you, uh, it's so funny as well because like, not not to be like stereotyping or anything, but in in the context of Barley Lands being this like cute little farm craft park. village yeah. farm park and everything, you can from a mile away 
spot any of us that are there for Warhammer. Metal, like, me- metal shirts and carry cases. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like, all yeah. You got to, You've never seen so many beards in your life. Yeah. <laughs> we were all, we were all, I think me, you and, and Sam. Sam were chatting uh, outside and a guy like walked, uh, a guy was just like walking and you could tell he was like looking around like, and didn't say a word. James just turned around to him and went, it's just up there. And he was like, oh, okay, cheers. And then just walked up. Like, you could tell 100%. I spotted, I spotted the Citadel carry case. Yeah, who was yeah. there for Warhammer and yeah. who, who was there to try and enjoy like a Who was there for the jam. Park. Yeah, who <laughs> was there for jam. jam. War route, come for the blister packs, stay for the jam. Stay for the, the jam. jam. The jam's yeah. good. The jam is great. To be yeah, fair. It's really yeah, good. it's really cool. We'll put some like links and stuff. Uh, do we have, is there a date for the next one? Uh, November 19th. November 19th. 19th at Barley Lands. Barley Lands in Billericay yeah. in Essex. Yeah. Right. And to be fair, like, again, you say like people are people coming to Essex, whatever. We have, there's we, people, we've had people. So, it's a pilgrimage. I met we, someone who was from Brighton. Yeah. yeah. Who'd driven to, to Barley Lands just for it. We've like, had some long, we had people come from Derby. We've had people go, it's crazy. Like, and we've had trader requests from people all over, which is just crazy. And every single well. one of them are like, oh, you should do this in Brighton. Oh, you should do this yeah. in Derby. Oh, you should do this in London. Yeah. That, that, there, there are, me and Sam have spoken, there are some plans to do some other things with it, like take other places and stuff. But like, admittedly, the first thing, like, we want to just, Focus it in Essex and then and then just like yeah. gradually build it. You that know? could be a good idea actually. If anyone listening's got somewhere, you know, like a local yeah, gaming yeah. scene or local painting like Warhammer scene, and there's a suitable Venue. place for something like that like yeah. that does boots house, then drop a comment. Yeah, definitely, we'll be up for it. Like, so we want to take it other further field and just build it a little bit. It's just, yeah, it's really cool. I think like, it's great. Like one of the things I think that's really good about it is like especially like it's free entry for kids as well, which is really good. Like, so if if you're, if you're I mean, it's only two, it's like what two two quid to get in. Anyway, yeah, it's yeah, like so two it's pounds like, to get in. Like for as a, as a, like an attendee. Raffles as well. Yeah, as classic a, boots and yeah. stuff, mate. Yeah, it's brilliant. Raffle prizes are great as well. Like some really good raffle prizes you can get. Um, but but. I think one of the things I really like about it is um, it's like creating for the, for youngsters that do come to it. It's creating that. Or oh, how did you get into Warhammer? And it's like, well, I got something from War, War Game Boots. So I just think it's a really nice way to kind of like have an entry point into it. You get, and there's also that thing about getting getting models for for like for cheaper and stuff like that as well. Obviously, there's, there's the world climate of the way it is at the minute and stuff like. War it's Bo- all yeah because it's independent traders. It's like the prices can be anything. Yeah, like, they are. They're, yeah, there are some. I'm you know, not kidding you. That's there are some things which is quite frankly impossible to not not buy them because it's just like it's my fear of going <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like it's crazy like um yeah so i i yeah i got two things that i really wanted like Mordian iron guard for me like one of my favorite imperial guard regiments so to get two boxes of red box i mean they're, they're, they're opened they had some of them had paint on them you know they, but obviously being metal we can strip them like just to get two complete boxes is uh, you know it's it's, it's it's quite hard to get that nowadays. So to just walk, go to a war boot and just, you know, and just get it is just brilliant, you know. So, so yeah, that would have been a good spot for the old uh, Knights Marine Challenge. Though, right? It would, yeah, 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 yeah. It's good, yeah. But if you, if you, if you, if you're up for it and you want to come down, it's uh, yeah, Barley Ends in Bit of Ricky, uh, November nineteenth, next one. So, so yeah, cool, cool. Right, I wanted to talk this week about what I think is the most overlooked part of painting Warhammer prep. Makes or breaks a model. As experienced a model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, like, I would say I'm probably quite a slow builder for Warhammer. Because one, I find it quite therapeutic because I want to enjoy it. But two, I'm super methodical about cleaning models. And I've always just had the mindset of the more time you put into the prep, the more headaches you're going to save later. Because I think we've all had it where you might have painted a model that's like maybe been stripped before or been through the walls, poorly built, regardless. It's quite hard to hide that sort of stuff. Um, and there's a lot of times, or I don't know if you've seen this, I've seen a lot of like really well painted models, but they'll be like a mold line or a sprue joint that wasn't sanded quite smooth. And it's like... Or even a pin shine or something like that where yeah, it's yeah. converted. Yeah. yeah. So I want to talk about sort of the do's and don'ts, some of your little tips what you think the most important thing is, workflow, planning your projects. I know you like your hobby journals, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, we'll kick yeah. it off. Yeah, I I, I think, it, again, we've spoken about goals and things in previous episodes and, and, and talked about that, but I think there's a fine balance. I do hun- I wholeheartedly agree at planning a project, using a painting journal, planning the colors you're going to use, all those kind of things. It helps massively to just s- streamline your efficiency of time without sacrificing the quality so that you can approach a project with confidence. And if you do butterfly from project to project to project, having it documented somewhere 
And I'm not talking just like a pad. I'm talking buy yourself a proper art book that has grayscale pages that's designed to have acrylic paint put on them, etc. Spending a little money and buying one of those books is really invaluable for you because then you can have a project per page. And then if you do go back to an army six months uh, later, you can just go to that page and it's all there for you. So that helps massively because one of the big things that a lot... I've got to be careful in the way I word this because I don't want to come across as super linear because I do think experimentation and, and trying stuff is really important when it comes to miniature painting. However, if you are doing stuff in a very linear fashion, you're doing armies and doing all those kind of things, the consistency of a project is you need that framework in place to refer back to it, to remember stuff, you know, um, and I think that's really important to have that in a painting journal. Um, and I've always, I've already spoken multiple times about the last five, six pages of that book being a swatch, swatch pages where you just put a swatch of the paint, write how it finishes, write the, how it, uh, you know, uh, how it covers, write what it dilutes like, blah, blah, like all little notes next to the little swatches and build up a library of paint swatches in the back so that rather than needing to get paint off your paint rack, put it on the palette, try it on a bit of plastic or something, blah, blah, you can just literally flick to that bit and then it's all there for you. And if you build it while you're going, it, it's it's really helpful to then when you when you do start a new planning page, rather than sitting at your painting desk, you can sit sit in the sofa, sit in your garden, whatever, and you can just flick through those swatches and start writing your planning your project without needing to physically be at your painting desk. If that makes sense, um, I've been there on trips before where I've you know been on a flight or I've been on a train or whatever, and like my painting journal is I've got, I really want to paint Death Leap or I really want to paint this model or whatever, blah, blah, what colors am I going to use? And then I can start planning it using the journal and using my library of paint, which is in the back on the last five, six pages to basically come up with the, the complete scheme and everything so that when you sit down at your painting desk and you spent the time building and cleaning the model correctly, et cetera, the painting just becomes instantaneous. You know, you, you've got it all planned. I, I think a painting journal is worth the investment of money. I think it's worth the investment of time because it just, it saves you time later on in every single project that you undertake because you know it's like running a hundred meter sprint in in spikes and running it in slippers you know like it's it's very much having the best tool for the job to give you the most efficient way of painting and i think i think that helps hugely um you know especially especially for what we do as a company as well so so yeah yeah i think i'm very much the same in terms of like that side of prep where i touched on it on the last episode that i like to know recipe wise exactly what i'm going to be doing before i go into it otherwise if i am i'm just not i don't feel like i'm knowledgeable enough to free ball it and it work so i like to just sit down plan it know exactly what i'm doing and hopefully it'll work out a bit better that way yeah i mean like I, the reason i said a bit of a caveat there is at the same time i don't want to be like a party pooper i don't want to be the person that you know says oh we've got to be it's got to be strict like this all the time like you don't need to like there's nothing wrong with picking up a model and just having fun with it and not having any kind of plan and being a bit more random and picking colors using stuff because that's that breeds experimentation that breeds knowledge that then you can then put in the journal later down the line or oh, i mix these two colors together they made this color i'll take a swatch of that put that save that for later i feel like you like, can still have fun in the, it sounds so funny because it sounds like i'm doing the thing of like when people say they like fun but they like organized fun <laughs> but like you can still have fun and experimentation in what you're planning yeah like maybe i'm gonna use uh, I, you know i'm deciding i'm gonna use this off the wall color combination or this color that i've never used before but i'm planning it first yeah and then yeah, well, this I'm week doing... i'm gonna use evil sun's red instead of mephiston red it's yeah, yeah, be a crazy yeah. stuff like that yeah <laughs> yeah um I, I, th I think i think it's yeah like the balance between the two is is really helpful, but I think that once you start using one, you see the virtues and benefits of using one and the time that it saves you, which then you can put directly into your models. I think painting any other way or not not planning projects in general, it, it, you, you will see a huge difference in sort of like what you can achieve if you use one and if you don't use one. Um, and I, I, I just think it's really important. One thing I will say is that, and it's something I have to um, hold myself back on a little bit, is I had, the, I had the term not too long ago, like a couple of months ago, probably uh, lazy perfectionism. So lazy, being a lazy perfectionist. And um, I felt personally attacked when I, <laughs> when I read it because basically it's this notion that um, you're a perfectionist and you want things to be perfect, but you're so much so that if you don't feel like it can be done perfect, you won't do it at all. So you start prolonging, you know, reasons why I haven't started something yet or I won't do it. It's like 
This is just rationalizing your procrastination. Yeah, yeah. If you have like, um, yeah, like it can be anything like putting, tidying up the your room or something or tidying up your living room and you don't have time to do it all right now. So, and I, cause I can't, I can't do it perfectly. I'm just not going to do it. Like that's kind of how it goes. Right. And I get like that with painting sometimes where it's like, I, sometimes I fall into the trap of me planning is me just taking longer to start. Do you know what I mean? I, I can't I spend, start yet. I haven't done my plan. Exactly. Yeah. I can't paint yet because it's not going to be perfect because I haven't done my plan. So I can't paint that model yet. I'll have to do my plan. I can't do my plan tonight because da 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 da. And it, it just, you just start putting it off. And I, I feel like, so I have to make sure that I've like, I set myself some limits when I'm doing no, I get that stuff because it can take, I can just go on for ages. I kind of do the opposite of all of this. I like retrospectively documenting. So rather than planning everything before I start, I'm going to fight for the people here. I will document most things I do for a project because I hate going back to something in six months and being like, oh, I actually can't remember what colors I used or how I did that. But how many times have you been there where you've, you, you, you're documenting and you forget the color that you've used or you forgot something? Well, I document like as, a, as, immediately as, after. as, as you go. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. All right. But like, I don't like the planning bit because I feel like I'll, I fear spending like 20 minutes setting up a plan and then I've got this great idea in my head because I'm theorizing basically what I'm going to do. And then I put the brush on the model and instantly it's wrong. Yeah. And I'm like, oh no, I've got to like rethink everything. That was all a waste of time. I hate that bit. I, th I think if you're, if you are regimented and you document as you go, that's, that's just as good. I think definitely. However, when you get lost in creativity, I, I'm sure there'll be someone watching this or some people watching this that they'll get five, six, seven, eight, nine steps down the process. And then they'll be like, oh, I, I, what did I, do? I forgot what I used for that. Or what, what was it I used for that? Or whatever. Like, so I understand totally. And if you, if you can document as you go, 100% it's just as good as pre-planning the whole thing or planning 90% of your choices before. All I would say is planning before gives you the security of that if you do get lost in creativity you can still do it though because i feel like if you set your plan up and then say say out of your four step process that you planned yeah yeah step four doesn't quite work out and you change it yeah yeah and then you forget to go back and amend yeah the plan that you set yeah yeah you could potentially still do something different to the plan and when you go back in six months you've got the sort of wrong no i understand yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um my rule is basically i've got to write it down while it's still on the palette so i might have finished painting it might be like the next day, but like the paint is like still on my wet palette. So God, if like I did forget what a color was, I can literally put a bit on the palette and check if it's yeah. the same color. Yeah. See, that won't work for me because I'm one of these people that like, I really can't be bothered to change my palette. So I'm using the tiny little bit left. Oh, on I'm there. one of those people. Uh, I'm yeah. using the tiny little corner left because uh, uh, there's all like splodges from like four models ago over on the other side of it and stuff like that. So mine will just be, I'd be giving myself too much lead time, I think, on that. I'd yeah. be like absolutely rinsing yeah. the tiniest little bit left. Usually I'll have a good enough memory that like by the end of finished painting a model and it's completely done after the fact, I can still sit down and go, right. what did I do for it? And I'll probably get it I right. Think it's it, also, let's be honest, the paints are still on the desk. They exactly. Haven't, they haven't been put away yet. Yeah. We're not, no one's perfect. Yeah. yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. Like I've been there. My desk looks like carnage after yeah. it. Which is even more so why. If, I can't be having that. I can't. People see my I desk and they're like, "Oh, did you tidy up for that photo?" I'm like, "No, I hate mess." I can't. <laughs> I can't. Um, I can't document as I go because I'm. I'm in the zone. I mean, because well, you are. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I'm not going to get the Donny in out like you said the other week. But like, but the, but the, the, you are like. I'm surprised you don't just channel the force and you write the colors down and it comes up on the model. No, that's. I'm feeling. <laughs> wild rider red. <laughs> wild rider red. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I wish I wish I could document as I go because that would be really helpful for me. And um, but I've I've through failure and through forgetting from previous projects, I know that the way for me to do it is to go right. I'm going to paint this model. These are some of the colors I'm going to be using. There might be during the process. I'll I'll try a bit and be like, that's not right. And then I'll, I'll but at that point, and I'll stop everything. At that point, I'll then change it because otherwise. It, I'll get three, four, five, six steps down the line and I'll be like, oh, I forgot my views. Oh, that's, so, that's way too disruptive for me. Yeah. I couldn't do that. Yeah. I couldn't do that. It's really interesting, like the way, different ways people paint as well. This is the thing. And again, from classes, this is the thing you see. I, I, I see so many different approaches to painting, like even the way people put stuff on the palette and like all this, like, but, it, but I think 
in the grand scheme of things, I think in, in, for this episode, and I, I think however you choose to, 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 to plan your project, I think doing some form of planning is better than, than just throwing caution to the wind and being like, oh, I'm just not going to document anything. I think that it's really important because the worst thing is you complete that model and you use something on it that you absolutely love or a te- not even the technical side of things, just a color choice or a mix or something like that. And you're just like, oh, I don't, I don't actually know what I've done that. And then that's before we talk about paints desaturating as they dry on the palette as well. So you could have a really vibrant color on the palette that you mix and enjoy that color and put it on the model. And then it changes hue because of drying or whatever, blah, blah, it changes slightly. And you don't remember the exact, exact I'm not going to lie. I feel like most people are like us and they don't have so many paints that they're going to forget. I know yeah. you've got like 2,000 paints or whatever it is, but... <laughs> For most I people, I didn't come up with that number. I'm just saying, by the way. Yeah, yeah that's like, probably an accurate number. For most people, I feel like underselling I'm, it. If anything, exactly. That's conservative yeah, estimate. Yeah. No, I feel like I've I've got like 10, 15 red, so it's going to be one of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to forget that quick. No, yeah. no, I get that. I, I, but I, I'm not going to be like, oh, it's dried slightly differently. Oh, I don't know if that is that color. There's no, no I, chance. I, I get that, but the, I, I do think I just think some form of plan in any way, shape, or form is is something that I would massively advocate touching upon other episodes to so someone starting out i think from day one you should say to people like write down notes of what you've used because even when you're newer into doing this and painting miniatures that i think the likelihood of wanting to repeat stuff or do stuff again to improve it from the first time you've done it is is magnified hugely so by having some kind of like this is what i've used this is what i've done i've done this 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 or i've chosen these colors i think it's really important starting out as a painter or just even progressing as a painter um but yeah i think to try to sort of round it out like you know having a plan be it a journal a notepad a swatch book whatever i think that that is something that is in my mind a staple thing for a painter personally this is probably a bit like tangential or maybe this is just more of like a personality trait than anything but i feel like i just glossed over this a moment ago i feel like the tidier my workspace and the more like organized everything is and even like having a clear mindset and like you know i've done everything like my coffee like it, even little things in prep, like I've sat down, I've got everything I need around me, I've got my Sitting coffee. Sitting down is key. Sitting down <laughs> is key, I would say. I've never said, I don't know anyone who paints standing up. But, uh, no, that wasn't my point. Anyway, <laughs> I feel like I do my best, cleanest work when everything is like 100%. in order. Yeah. I don't like this, like, I've got 15 minutes, let's quickly like the paints everywhere, like it's carnage. I feel 100%. like that's when you're more likely to make mistakes. See, see I, I love a bit of, I love a bit of, I think, that's stressful, I, mate. It's not. Like, I look that, at your desk and I actually get like that, secondhand yeah, this anxiety. Is, this is literally just like personality yeah, and stuff. Is, like, I that's how he lives his life. I just don't yeah. know how you can paint something that clean when you're in an environment Surrounded that messy. By chaos, because because yeah. for me, it's like, the again, the focus is purely on the palette and the model. So for me, having stuff around, it doesn't really bother me. Like I don't, I'm not like painting going, oh, that purple over there is like, oh, that, that doesn't, that, that's not how it kind of works for me. I, I literally, it doesn't. No, but, but it's just I, like in I, general, having a nice environment mm. is going to lead to better mindset, better work. I, I do agree. I, I, I also, f- I personally like the end of uh, the end of a, of a painting process when you finish the model and you've done all the checks and everything, blah, blah, that clean up of desk and putting it back to uh, a clean environment. For me, that's like, closure on the project and i actually enjoy that because it's like the down oh, I get that. You, know, you know that nice feeling you get yeah. i get that every 15 minutes when i put the dropper <laughs> bottle back on the rack yeah. see i don't it doesn't I, that it doesn't I constant don't, dopamine mate i, I up. don't i don't i, I, I feel don't, like yeah. i'm somewhere in between because i feel like i want what you're explaining i have that at the beginning hmm. and then it just slowly gets worse as i get yeah I'm the, I'm, I'm, yeah I'm the same mine does descend in, it starts really clean because i've got a clean desk when i start and then i refuse as to I, believe that. as i'm saying <laughs> As I'm selecting colours, obviously they stay there rather than going back. But I, yeah, I don't know. I just I also have a small desk, so I'm like limited as to how much mess I could have physically I feel like, anyway. But I feel like I've only just thought of this. I'm way more efficient when it's tidy because I know just from muscle memory of like where every single paint exists I on my rack. You, yeah. And I hate having like a pile of paints in front of me and being like looking for like one specific one. Like it just slows me down. It's too disruptive. No, I, 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 yeah, I agree. I agree. Maybe that's yeah. something to take away from this for me. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Calling you out for your messy. I, yeah. I, I, it's messy just always, it's always how I've been. And I, I just, it, like, things around me or things, uh, things just on the desk, it doesn't, it doesn't. I don't watch things when I paint. I, I think that's a step over the line. Like for, me, <laughs> step over for, for, for me, for me, because I get visually, that's a step too far. Cause, cause it will I can visually, have a messy desk, but oh will... my god, you listen to like a podcast. By the way, no, no. by the way, there's literally, 
literally people watching this painting now and you've just attacked them. There is someone with an iPad in front I've, of their hobby I, desk right no, now. No, for me, I'm talking purely for me. For, I can't watch you something. You just said it's a step two. It's a step two. For, for me, yeah, for me. I can't I can't watch something while I'm painting. I can listen to something like a podcast, audio book, whatever. Like, I'm happy to listen to stuff, but visual, visual, it's something visual on a screen will distract me. An inanimate object, like a paint pot or something in front of me, personally doesn't. I don't it's not know. that it's distracting. It's just that it's your environment that you're in. Isn't yeah, it? That doesn't that's, that's it doesn't bother. It doesn't bother. It is. Yeah. Maybe that's contradictory me. then, because I've watched many a movie while painting. Yeah, yeah. I can't. Yeah. I can't do it. I've been organized there. though I've on been, my little dedicated. Yeah. Hold I've been. I've been there painting, watching that scene from Die Hard, where he's watching the fire go down the runway to get the. I've been. I've been there. You know, like, and it just doesn't. It for me. I've I been just, there, man. And what are you? I like. I'm not gonna lie. Like, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I like just putting like trash TV on in the background. Just so I'm not even looking at it. Just so that there's like some. What you like watching Love Island while you're painting? Yeah? <laughs> not Love Island. <laughs> I mean, I've watched Love Island before, but we, but that's but a, that's a step what, too far for me. To, Love Island's a step too far. No, like just trash TV, mate. Just like yeah, whatever. Like, not even necessarily that side of trash TV. Just like re, like other reality shows, like put like Bargain Hunt on or something. Like just like noise. Like it's just something happening. I don't care if I miss any of it because I don't actually care about yeah, yeah. it. Just something happening. That's going to be related. That's surely got to be related. The thing you were saying about people Because my my thing with, (laughs) I don't even like necessarily listening to podcasts all the time while I'm painting because Mm. it's stuff that I care about listening to. Yeah, I'm the same. So like, I do, there are like painting podcasts and stuff that I'll listen to, but it won't be my entire painting session. I can't just listen to podcasts for the whole time. I need, I I like the noise, but I don't even, I do, I have music as well that I listen to. I think we've all been there where you've been like listening to a podcast or something and you realize you're like, I haven't been paying attention for the last 15 minutes and I have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, but I'm actually really interested. I think it's it's the visual thing for me. Like it's visual. I can listen to a podcast or listen to something, but I can like, for example, even if it's on YouTube, I won't have that screen open. Well, it's good news. You can listen to uh, Paint Perspective on your audio platform (laughs) of your choice. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So yeah, but no, I think, I think, yeah. Planning. More, More a bit directly on the prep then. What's your sort of a go-to process, right? So you've got, let's not say an army, let's say like just a mid-size, like I'm adding some bits or bobs, whatever. Mm-hmm. You've got your box of models in front of you. What's step one? Build it all, clean it all, get it all done. Get so it all, get I, it all clean. I clip and clean. Yeah. So clip the part, clean the part. I don't clip them all, clean them all. Oh no, I, cl- I clip and clean. So I'll clip everything. No, no, the whole I clip, no, I clip and clean. Clip, <laughs> clip and clean no, is yeah, my you, one. You do by part, don't you? you yeah, do, yeah, yeah, individually. No, I, so I'm, I clip the part and I clean the part. No, that, that's why I'm, I, will, I will cut it all out. I don't know what you're saying. I'll, yeah. I'll cut everything out. You're a maniac. The whole sprue. Yeah. No, surely the parts you need, not the, not the entire sprue. Uh, yeah, 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 you beg yeah, your pardon. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. The parts <laughs> that I need. I, I'm just, I was thinking like a character. You're going to use all the parts from the character sprue typically. Like my, yeah, yeah. Way, yeah. So, but That's, even so, then what I do is I clip the part out and I clean the part and then I clip the next part that I need and I clean that part because I know this might not be a problem for a lot of people, but I've had it too many times before where I like, sometimes you can get some sneaky, uh, sneaky sprue joins and stuff that you forget about Mm -hmm. so for me if i've just clipped it off i know exactly where the joins are i know exactly where the mold lines are that makes sense and i go go through that part clean it and then it's done i know that's really the glue when i when i need to so i do it per per part i do it like per instruction step yeah yeah, yeah. that's literally the order that i do it yeah and then i'll glue once i've got the next part it's cleaned glue that leave that to the side Cut the next part, clean it. Da, da, so if I do a squad, I'll cut squad squad member one out, put all the parts there. Squad number two, I, I cut it all out, yeah. all of it, literally cut, and I'll just go through cleaning it. Because I, I, for me, I, I want closure on that step. So like, I like to cut it all out, get rid of the sprue, bin that, that's gone, that's out of my life, and then literally just clean through all the parts. Out of my life. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, get the sprue out of your life. That should be a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Um, get get that's get all the. I, I cut it all out and then clean it all as one action. So I just work by action. So build, cut it all out, clean it all, build it all, and then, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think even if I'm going through, I don't a, like going back. Infantry squad. I like. Right. Let me build this model. Then let me like from clipping to cleaning to building. That's one model. Done. Usually on clipping to cleaning, to, but it's the second one because I like that. I'll I'll learn something to watch out for 
on the next model. Next one, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. I, I just like to, that's the full process done on one model. I'll go to the next one. It's not the most time efficient one. I imagine a lot of commission painters won't do it, but that's it kind of depends because like me. some instruction books will be like build all the torsos and legs and then like the arms is like a separate step. For I, I do tend to follow. Yeah. Like the, but sometimes it will be stuff. like build this one model, build this one model, yeah. like one by one. Most completion. of the time it's that if yeah. it is it, a lot of the older kits were the ones where it was like hit, build the legs and the torso and then add the other stuff. Well, it's because there was multi-part, wasn't it? I, I, I would say that the, the way the instructions have changed, I mean, we're talking predominantly here about 40K or Williams Workshop models. I'd say the instructions have, have kind of guide the way that you build and clean as, as, as the way they've been written. So in the early days, like in, the old, uh, in, uh, in the old sort of tactical Marines, you cut the legs out, stick all the legs to the bases, cut the torsos out. Do you work it? Do you see what yeah. I mean? Like, I but, tend to just, moon... yeah, follow that kind of order of fully building the model, then fully, like from cutting it off, then fully building the next model. If, I, if I'm doing squads, I like to have all the individual models in groups of parts. So yeah. have them all cut out in groups. So I know those parts are for that model, those parts are that model. And then that way, just work through clean with those, clean with those, clean with those, clean with those, then build that one, then build. That. So yeah, that's the way that I put, I, I've always done it. Do you know what was a big game changer for me on the cleaning thing? I know you don't do this. We've had a bit of a chat about this. I ditched the hobby knife and I went straight for just the um, scalpel handle with just the blades. Mm -hmm. And you can buy literally a box of, it's literally a hundred like scalpel blades. And having a fresh like razor sharp blade is so nice for cleaning yeah, it models because it just Takes carves it off, through like that. And the second it gets like a bit blunt, like you, you've got a hundred of them, like they're they're so cheap, yeah, yeah, and you can just go straight onto a fresh clean one because I'll notice you're more likely to damage the part and cause like a tear with a rougher knife. With a rough knife, because yeah. if you've got like a sprue joint and you're trying to cut through it flush with the model and it starts to tear and gouge out like a little yeah. divot in the model, you can avoid that entirely. I think people probably don't realize that a lot of the problems they're having with cleaning is from a blunt knife. Mm. Yeah, I see the knife I clean mold lines off is like the bluntest on those blades ever. Because of the angle that of attack, on I can see that for the mold yeah. line. But obviously, you've got yeah. there's more than that, isn't there? There's the so actual sprue, sprue joints. joints. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, again, sorry to talk about last episode's hack, but that's where Tamiya Sandin phone comes in. That's they paying you or something? I'm not endorsed by Tamiya. <laughs> if Tamiya are watching this, they want to get this. <laughs> you know, like, if there's like a massive chunk though, or like something's, like, I mean, I'm not going to sit there and like sand or like file. Like no, 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 no. You're right. Yeah, plastic. a sharp knife for doing that definitely. But I, I, that's where I think the combination of those really good Japanese-made clippers that we always bang on about they're really good like for getting super close they're probably the best clippers i've probably ever used um and, and then using those to cut the parts out a quick demold line with my blunt knife and then tamiya sanding foam that for me as a process of getting rid of sprue joints or mold lines is just i've since i've started using those different tools and bits and bobs i've, I've always used my blunt my tiny yellow handled balloon uh yellow handled knife i've used that for 15 years you know like it's, and it's the same blade it, you know, it's literally the same blade, and, but it gets mold lines off like amazingly. Um, I yeah. might genuinely get through two or three blades if I'm building like a box of 10 models. Yeah. That's crazy. That's a lot of blades. Sharp's box. You need to buy one of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I, I, for me, like, I don't, I don't have the mental expensive clippers, but I can They're see how, expensive. I can see, I can see how that would make it easier. But for me, it's like, I, it's a step I haven't got to think about. And, you're most likely to cause damage to a part when it's still on the sprue. Yeah, of course you are, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll cut as far away from the actual as part much, like, as I can, keep as much sprue joint on there, and then literally just just come straight off of the scalpel. And it's yeah. just like super clean. It's so interesting the way that... And it doesn't as well. Like, you know how the finish of the plastic will change? It will like frost. It will go a bit white. Yeah, yeah. You don't get that with these. It's literally yeah. like the same color, yeah. everything. Those, mm -hmm. those Japanese clippers aren't that expensive though. All right. 20 pound 25 pounds yeah but regardless it's still a clean up step right yeah so yeah. it's still like i'm still removing yeah, one step, step from the yeah. process yeah yeah no i just yeah yeah primer cast black mate all day long it's not been broken for 20 plus years it's the same it's you're partial to the color forge joe i love a bit of color forge, a bit of color forge i like both don't get me wrong both are good yeah. um i don't mind like chaos black's fine it's been it's great i love this i, I like i know a lot of people prefer a matte finish i i like i like find it way easier to paint over i do but I, li I like satin as well i do like a bit of the satin finish that the back does give i do like it quite a lot um most of the time i'm airbrushing a color over it anyway yeah i've done a full 360 on the airbrush thing because i was spray priming everything with chaos black for like first couple of years i was painting then i got the airbrush and i'm like oh this is brilliant i can just 
buy a big bottle of airbrush primer and chuck that on, I'm save a load of money. I'm not a big fan of this. I was going to say, I I started doing, I've done that for ages and it always caused me headaches. I don't know if it was just because the, the, the few primers that I tried were just crap and didn't stick. I'm not sure what the problem was. I found that it wasn't as strong. Like I was more likely to no, scuff it, it or rub, chip it. No, you're correct. 100%. I went through a phase of painting loads of Forge World stuff for my own Warrior Army and I surface primed a load of models for it. Um, and it's a combination of it being thin for, for airbrushing. Like, it's like, I don't know. The risk is lower. The there ri is The that. risk is lower, but it's like building, building a house and the foundations like are made out of jelly. Of is you know the, what I mean? Like it's, part of it is that it doesn't have the, the like bad chemicals in it. Mm. And they're obviously what makes the aerosol work a bit better or something. So when you go to a restaurant and like the hygiene rating's lower, the food tastes better probably. <laughs> It's like that kind of thing. Are you one of those people who's like, I want to go to like the cheapest, worst like, kebab shop on the high street? I'll pay more. I'll pay more <laughs> if it's a one out of five hygiene kebab shop. I, I, I just think as a, for priming, it's the foundation that everything else gets put on. And I think you need the best, the best coverage, the best, the best, just the best finish on that, of that primer. And surface primer for me, it, I find that it rubs off quite easily sometimes. And uh, it, it doesn't, it just doesn't cover, not, not cover, it just, it just doesn't give you that foundation that you need. I made the change on accident because I had a massive project and I didn't have, uh, I was, it was orcs actually. I was, I was doing a massive orcs project and I didn't have the green that I wanted to spray them with like as an airbrush primer. I was like, I don't want to spray them all black with airbrush primer and then paint them again. And I was trying to like cut time yeah, because time was of the essence for that project. So I was like, oh, I'll buy just a can like as a one-off because it was a ton of models as well. I was like, obviously it is quicker to, put everything right. on a box and rattle can it. Like that's yeah. just inarguable. Yeah. And then I done that and I was like, this is so much better. Why am I not doing this all hair, the time? Hair dryer to, to dry the paint on as you're, as you're undercoating it. You're, that's controversial because you can cause problems doing that. If you're using a Ferrari Volcano hair dryer, then yeah, fair enough. But like if, if you get a cheap budget travel There's risk dryer, reward of that because I love a hair rattle dryer. cans can Anyone be fake all the best Anyone who knows yeah, I, 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 I love a hair dryer. Like, to be honest, I've got to say with the color forge stuff, I haven't found I found um, the need for that. I haven't so found quick. the need. It it dries so quickly. Yeah. Like I haven't found the need to have to hair dryer it. Yeah. Um but it in general, for me, like I have I'm not really using the color forge colors. Mm. I'm using the color forge black as a primer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm airbrushing I'm doing the same color thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. over the yeah. top anyway. I, I still I still rank cast black. I love it. It's been as I said, it's been around for twenty plus years and they haven't changed the, the name or anything. Whether the paint's changed or not, I don't know. But <laughs> I but I don't I don't believe it's changed that much. And 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 it's still great, yeah. I write yeah. I, I rate it hugely. I like, do think value for money. Oh, value back. for money. Colour Forge, yeah, definitely. Be a bit yeah. Bigger do, can, less money. I, I yeah. wish, I wish Colour Forge done a matte, uh, a, 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 a satin, satin, a satin I like the matte, though. I like the matte, don't get me wrong, but I I, just, I love the matte because, as I say, I'm painting over it anyway. I can also, like, I feel like I can see the model better. See what I'm painting Yeah, but, you know, but what I'm saying is that you, the reason why I think a satin can would be good or just a can that's like house black is if you're painting, if you're painting a black armoured model, you could undercoat it with matte and then undercoat and then paint it with a black with a satin and you'd have a really nice surface finish for for, for the armor yeah and you i just said undercoat with matte undercoat with color forge and then do chaos black over the top why not just but use then, the color forge then, then at that point uh, sorry then, why not just use the chaos black then at that point what's the point of the color forge? because it's about the double layer so you'd get you get a, a color forge can and put it back and then you put a color can over the top and fist in red and the crack i don't love the idea top. of doing two coats of airbrush uh, sorry i don't love the two idea of doing spray two cans. spray coats because that's that's so thickness just, and texture. That I think it with. depends on depends on how you use a can. It's also twice the risk of yeah. having a bad can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But also, yeah. the I don't like the I don't like the idea of um, using a primer as your main color anyway mm. because it's one of the first things you learn even when you start watching Warhammer tutorials is that all right, you know, it would save time. If I wanted a black, if I was painting the black Templar and I could just spray it chaos black and then highlight that, that would save time. But yeah. there's no, you can't correct your mistakes as well because no, uh, yeah. the, you don't have chaos black. Unless you're using Color Forge matte black and some <laughs> Vallejo 950. That is a pretty spot on that. It's it's literally but I still, exactly the same. even still, I, I don't do it because I'm, I'm not as comfortable with doing that because i just feel like i need to know that it's like gonna be a match yeah, if yeah no for, for my for my black templars i do the matte black but i base coat them yeah. after for yeah. clean up like yeah. you said yeah yeah 
I think I think all of those things are really really good things to to put into your process. All the things we discussed, like the, the journal and the, the spray can and some bits and bobs. I think that that hopefully gives a real good benchmark of of, of stuff to help people. I think. Um, I think it's also just in general how different all of us have just said a load of the answers does show that like it's so varied. Some of it's going to work for you, and some of it isn't. Yeah, um, take away what you take away from this, whatever you feel that it's going to be applicable for for your own painting, and just try different things and see what works. Mm. Just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to accommodate for a variety of needs and budgets. Whether you want a centerpiece character for your army or a full-blown gaming force, we have what you need and we offer well above the industry standard in terms of painting quality and our service. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk. And in the month of September, new clients can get 5% off of any commission using code SEPTEMBER5. I've been so excited for this one. So I gave everyone a task this week, which was to come up with the plot of a Warhammer movie in a different genre and fan cast who you would like to play each of the characters. So I'm, uh, we, haven't, we haven't discussed before what anyone's, what anyone's doing. So we're going we're gonna to find out and react to this live. But uh, James has been going on at long length sort of a trash talk in before the before the show and the preamble. James is like so happy with his one. I really like my one, yeah. But I'm convinced he's going to say at least one thing that George has no reference for, doesn't get doesn't no, get I the think, reaction that he needs I think, at I think, all. I think he'll be all right, actually. I think he'll be all right. I've not gone too retro on this, so don't worry. And that's not a dig at George, <laughs> No, by the way. It's not. I've not gone too retro on this, but I've got... There's two people in that conversation, I'm, I'm and it ain't a dig at George. Yeah, right. I'm representing everyone under 30 on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean i can do mine if you want to start off let's let's right first of all what is the uh movie genre that you've gone for so i, I don't really know what the genre is and i'll explain Brilliant. why that's no, oh great right, <laughs> right. I, 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 great start okay I, there's I, what right so, james there's, there's one thing you've got to do next week come up with a genre for a movie okay well i've okay, done the genre so but. It's, it's like it's a comedy basically so it's a comedy take a comedy take on on so what i've tried to do is is do a film from a from a specific part of one of the heresy books basically it's like a film about that specific thing or that's that period of time during the heresy so it's uh it's where vulcan crashes onto onto mccrag and he's basically going nuts on mccrag okay um and you've got gulliman john grammaticus and comrade kurz are all like in the mix basically so it's just and he loses his hammer as well so basically um so it's basically that part. Pull, of, he that, pulls a Thor. Yeah, basically, yeah. He teleports himself onto the crack. And then Gulliman picks up the so, hammer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it's 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 a scene scene there. And I've chosen four characters to represent, or four people to represent each of those characters. And I think it'd be hilarious as a as a as a film. Basically, just all the things that go on and the way that those actors or people would play the character. Basically, go on then. Who are you? Uh, who are you casting in this movie? So, Vulcan is portrayed by Chris Tucker. <laughs> Because I absolutely loved him in The Fifth Element. And I just think that him playing Vulcan would be hilarious. Like, absolutely hilarious. Just the way he is. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it'd be amazing. Um, I love everyone tuning into this. Like, oh, yeah. When Henry Cavill was uh, like <laughs> Valdor and da 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 da. And the first one we <laughs> drop is Chris Tucker, who He'd be hasn't amazing. been in a film for I don't know how long. He'd be an amazing Vulcan, I think. He's he <laughs> he he done a film in like 20 years. No, I, like, I know, but yeah, but that's the thing. Like, Vulcan's this stern, like, I just think him portraying him would be hilarious. Like, it'd just be super funny. Right. Um, uh, John Grammaticus is uh, a perpetual. Who is, who is this John character? Grammaticus is a character that goes through several of the books. He's a perpetual, so he's a, he lives, he's immortal. And he basically, okay. he's, him and Vulcan have got like quite intertwining lines. Um, so they have quite a lot of things where they're kind of like, John Gamatis is trying to basically kill Vulcan to, for lots of reasons, but there's there's lots of things going on in the books. But so I, I've got John Gamatis played by Ricky Gervais. <laughs> that's, not, that's not such a wild card. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Ricky Gervais only plays himself, so yeah. this entire character is just going to be Ricky what a Gervais. wild card. Yeah. He, yeah, he he would be he would be hilarious. Because there is there is zero chance that those two have ever been in the same room. I know, at but, the same time but I ever. just think that he yeah. he, he played amazing. Ricky, uh, he played amazing. He would play an amazing. He would play an amazing. Ricky, 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 Ricky. Yeah, I just think the way that he does it would be hilarious. Now, um, in in that book, Erebus, 
everyone hates Erebus anyway. But I think to 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 make Erebus really funny and and he'd have like a humorized, really dark kind of like approach to doing Erebus. Um, Frankie Boyle is my uh, is my <laughs> is my Erebus because I because I literally I I. I just the way that Frankie Boyle is, I think he oh, he would make such a great, <laughs> I did, a great. That's the one that's got me the most. I Scottish see, Erebus. He'd be, he'd be absolutely amazing. I think. Yeah. I didn't see like, that. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just think that would be absolutely amazing. Um, that's the one you asked me yesterday. Yeah, and you J- thought- yesterday, James went. Um, James went. Does it have to be an actor? And I went, no, that's kind of funnier if it's not. And he went, so it can be a comedian. And I went, yeah. And then I thought I had him because I went, it's going to be Lee Evans. Lee Evans is in it then. He knows he I'm loves a big Lee, fan Lee, He loves but... Lee Evans. And he went, oh, it's not actually. And oh, I completely cool. forgot about that. I didn't even think about who else it could possibly just... be. And I wouldn't have guessed that at all. Frankie Ball with Erebus, I think, would be hilarious. Just because uh, oh, I, just, I think it would be amazing. Um, and then finally, you've got Conrad Kurz. Now, Conrad Kurz is obviously quite a evil character, like quite bad. But I just think um, someone that would play him quite well would be Adam Driver. So the guy... Oh, that's actually that's a, actually a good, good pick. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think Adam one. Driver as Conrad Kurz would be absolutely amazing. That's a great actually. pick. Yeah. yeah. That is very good. He, that's spot on. I think he would be great because... What what a, what a mental movie. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine seeing the poster for that film yeah. and all of those actors on the same I, thing? I, I literally think that would be, uh, it'd be amazing because then when you look at all the different scenes and bits and bobs that are in Vulcan Lives, <laughs> Vulcan Lives which is the book... <laughs> Book. I just think that well, would be insane. Okay, anyway, so we've got Chris Tucker. Who's directing it? I don't know. I've got no idea. I haven't picked a director. Whoever can Stephen make, Merchant. Whoever, <laughs> yeah. whoever, whoever can make that lot work together. Hang on, bit, Chris Tucker. Bit, Chris Tucker. Chris Tucker. Ricky, 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 Gervais. Ricky Gervais. Yeah. Frankie Boyle was Frankie Erebus. Boyle and Adam Driver. <laughs> and Adam Driver. Yeah. That's my. Uh, that's my. That's my sort of like zoomed in short film about Vulcan landing on the crag. And having all these characters intertwine in the well, story. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if you understood the assignment perfectly or didn't understand <laughs> it at all. I'm still not sure if that was... I think if that wasn't the assignment, then the assignment was wrong. That's yeah. per, that's the per, that's brilliant. brilliant. I, I would watch it, I'm telling you now. Yeah. I, I think you'd have to watch it just based on the lineup. Yeah. 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 yeah so that's you might my, cause like the universe I, I, to implode I, with those. Yeah. those Frankie Boyle as Erebus, I think, would be absolutely amazing. That's unreal. Yeah. Like I just think he'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Right, Joe. Well, mine's mine's supposed to be funny, but I don't think I've got a patch on that now. But I'll, t- I'll we'll, we'll go. He's we'll wild, go he's done it. too much of a wild card we'll for, go this, with it. for this to pan out. How are we um, supposed to follow that? So mine isn't an already known. Mine's a comedy as well, um, but mine isn't a, an already built-in story within Warhammer. I'm, I'm, this is a new story. We're adapting a new story for. Uh, for Warhammer. So mine actually takes place even further in the future than Warhammer 40k. Warhammer 41k. No, no, no. This is Warhammer 50k, 50K, 50K 60k, 50K. something those are, like those that. Those are bigger numbers yeah. than 40. Okay. 50k, 60k. Okay. And You've never seen this many Ks before. <laughs> what has happened um, in this time is the, the world has healed. The universe has healed. Okay. Everything is back to... It's, it's an even better version as what it ever could have been before. This is it, like a Star Trek utopia. The universe has healed. The warp is closed. It's still there, but there's no access to anything like that. My law knowledge isn't uh, top tier, by the way. So if I get anything <laughs> wrong, please, uh, please don't uh, flame me in the comments. Remember, this is a comedy film fan movie casting. But the, the warp is there, but no one can... There's nothing to do with it. And, yep. and uh, humanity's thriving. Every species is, is, is thriving and there's schools and, and everyone's back to normal and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. And obviously in school you learn history um, and uh, history lessons for people of the, the Warhammer 60K timeline will yep. be learning about, you know, the events of yep. Horus Heresy and all the stuff that was going on thousands and thousands of years ago and stuff like that. Um, so there's two teenagers who are failing their history exam. And now some people might start to pick up that this is just Bill and Ted. <laughs> this is Bill and Ted, <laughs> but Warhammer. Um, first of all, two teenagers. I'm going, 
Tom Holland and Zendaya, right? <laughs> I I do understand they're they're I think they're thirty now, but mm. that I reckon if we made this film the next six months or something. <laughs> Very tight timeline. I reckon if we made this film in the next six months or something, Tom Holland and Zendaya, they can be teenagers still, I yeah. think. Well, Tom, we, we know you're listening uh, every yeah, week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Zendaya, not too keen. She's more of a painting phase girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, we, we're, we can make that work. Um, they're failing. They get visited from someone. They're, they're on their way home from school, whatever. They get visited by someone. Even further from the future, <laughs> right? From Warhammer seventy k. From Warhammer seventy k. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a navigator. Yeah. Which is spooky straight away. They've read about navigators in the books. They've read about. Like, they was just they've learning about, about that this morning. They've read yeah. about the wall. That is actually what was on the page that morning. Exposition. Yeah. How crazy is that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the navigator informs them that um, it's actually pivotal to the the uh, the universe. That they pass their history class and go on to yeah. to study history um, further. Yeah. So to ensure that those things don't happen again, and the, and the navigator's seen the future without that happening, and it's awful. And so the navigators come to them. So the best way for them, as in Bill and Ted, uh, to um, pass their history class is to go back in time. They go through the warp with with the navigator. Oh, the Navigator, by the way, is played by Walton Goggins. I don't know if you're familiar with <laughs> I'm not Walton familiar Goggins. with who that is. <laughs> who is that? Walton Goggins. It, go, bring him up. Have you just pulled a Clive Warren? No, 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 no. Walton Goggins. You'll know him. You'll know him. It, I think he would be a good Navigator. We'll have him all like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to search he's, he's a legend, mate. He's a legend, Walton Goggins. <laughs> Okay, right. You're not, you're not seeing, like, no, Hateful I'm, Eight, he's in? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm He's in the you. Hateful Eight. I'm with you, Joe. Yeah, Go on. I'm with you, yeah. Go on. You're losing so me. Walton Goggins. You can no, pull no, it back, no. you've it's got time. Walton Goggins, it's Walton Goggins and Zendaya and Tom Holland so far. The, I don't classic, think the ever, classic trio. I don't mm -hmm. think they've ever been in anything together. Yeah. Uh -huh. As it stands. Um, I just think he'd be a good, he'd be a good navigator. <laughs> yeah. Sort of add mech him up a little bit or whatever, <laughs> however they look. Yeah. Um, they have to go back to Warhammer 40k they have to witness what is going on yeah and they have to um the the assignment in particular is about space marines so they have to go and see what was going on and and talk to space marines and yeah. get the get the best possible account as that you can of a of a battle so the other three characters that they encounter encounter are three space marines okay um no specifics I've just gone, well, let's say it's a captain, a sergeant, and uh, well, actually, one, one of them definitely has to be a scout. One of them's a scout. So I'm going. Walton Goggins takes them to, um, <laughs> to Warhammer 40K mid-battle. Yep. I'm going, captain, who have I gone? What order have I gone? I'm in. Space Marine captain, I've gone Nick Offerman, who plays... Ron Swanson oh my in Parks God. and Recreation. Oh Are you familiar with Nick Offerman? <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Nick Offerman, as a Space Marine captain... Why could I picture that so perfectly? ...would be fantastic. <laughs> okay? So he he's the captain. We've got a sergeant of... I've gone Pedro Pascal as a sergeant, Space Marine sergeant. However, it's like... It's comedy, Pedro Pascal. Right, okay, yeah. <laughs> it's not it's not Last of Us, Pedro Pascal. <laughs> it's not Mandalorian, Pedro Pascal. It's like silly, goofy comedy, Pedro Pascal. Okay. And then finally, the Space Marine Scout, um, who I played by someone who I think would be a great addition to absolutely any film you could ever make, and that is Michael Serra. Oh my Michael god. Michael Serra. <laughs> As a Space Marine scout. <laughs> the juxtaposition of Offerman and Sarah. Yeah. He's going to be stood next to <laughs> yeah. We'd have to do some um, false perspective. Uh, yeah, like, like Lord of the Rings. Stuff, yeah. Lord of the Rings stuff, yeah. So they get chatting. They obviously talk to Offerman, Pascal, Sarah. Um, do they pass their exam and save the universe? We don't know. We don't know. We have to find, get to the end of the Who's film directing it? Out. Um, that's going to have to be... 
like it's got to be Michael Bay in it with no 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 I'm gonna go uh oh it's got to go it's got to be but I'm going Spielberg Spielberg yeah, Spielberg is strong. itching to direct this movie yeah. Spielberg I think could do a good job with Offerman and Sarah and Pascal I think and that that gets that I, I mean Walton Goggins I reckon be well up for it <laughs> I reckon he'll love it Charlie that was mental I don't think it's a good film. I think it's a good film. I like Bill and Ted, so I just wanted to do a 40K version of Bill and Ted. It's <laughs> 70 k version. Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. George. Your turn. Right. We've all, we've all got comedy. Bit of a twist, though. Mine's a romantic comedy. Oh, God. Okay. All right. Mine is a... You, you might notice a, a film that I've been uh, prompted by because uh, this is not quite as on the nose as your Bill and Ted recreation. I've not gone as deep on the plot as you like. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. This is more of a sort of... Well, James's plot was already written for him. That's true. That's yeah, so was mine. I, mine I, was Bill yeah. and Ted. <laughs> okay. I cheaped out. I cheaped out on plot and made up. Made well, up I've, characters. I've ripped off my movie more based off of uh, the conception of the of the actors than the uh, the plot of the movie. Right. Right. Okay. Right. So this is my my sort of. I'll, I'll say it first. This is a romantic comedy. We meet our hero. Right. It's an ultramarine. It could be an ultramarine of your choice, but obviously, I'm casting Ryan Gosling as my ultramarine. <laughs> Now, yeah, well, being an ultramarine, he's very, he's very by the book, right? So we catch him like mid-battle. He's doing the ultramarine thing, but we can tell there's just something not quite, not quite right about about his life. Well, he's I doing... feel like I feel like ultra, ultramarines and Ken are quite like, well, yeah, by it's the funny, book. It's funny you should say Ken, Joe, because <laughs> during a battle with some harlequins, oh no, <laughs> across the battlefield. <laughs> Ryan Gosling, our hero, locks eyes with who other than Margot Robbie? Margot Robbie, the Harley Quinn. See, I could see, I I, I I could see that because of Joker. Oh, Harley Quinn. Oh, Harley Quinn. Yeah, yeah. Harley I Quinn. imagine that's. Where I mean, you I don't know how you didn't connect those I imagine, dots. I imagine yeah. that's where you were going. That's with where that. I was going with it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I get it. The Joker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cheers, James. Yeah, that's all right. I mean, I imagine that's that's. I thought that's the penny that was dropping the second. Ago. Well, yeah. he sees her being badass, tearing it up on the battlefield, and he's doing mm. his Ken thing, just lusting after her, you know, mm. catching eyes. I'd just like to point out, I haven't watched the Barbie film, so I don't know. No, That's I fine. But you're gonna, after this story, you're going to feel like you've seen it. Okay. <laughs> so the battle goes on. She's, you know, she. So let's say it was a, it was a nil-nil battle, right? She's, <laughs> nil-nil? What is this, a no, football match? You know, some some stuff happened in, in the war. Who knows, right? They get split off, right? She's off in the distance, never to be seen again. He's a, uh, Ryan Gosling's had this complete epiphany, right? He's got to go on this quest to go and find his one true love. Of course. Oh, yeah. Margot Robbie. Yeah. So he bands together with some cast and crew, you know, some side characters mm-hmm. who are going to go on this adventure with him across the galaxy. Okay. Right? Who other than <laughs> his trusty servitor duo. <laughs> right. Oh, God. <laughs> We've got a similar route with this, Joe. I was trying to keep a straight face. The duo of... I don't even know his name, which makes it funnier. McLovin from Superbad. <laughs> you can't give him that. You gotta look up his name at least. No, that's way funnier. Christopher I don't know. Christopher uh I'm sure it's like Christopher Mintz Plus or something. Whatever it is. <laughs> and obviously his sidekick, Michael Sarah. Oh, we both have Michael both Sarah have Michael in Sarah. our 40k film. That's insane. And I had to throw one more in there because we said five characters. Yeah. So I'm just going to take a tertiary guardsman. Who other than Danny DeVito? Oh my Perfect. God, that's brilliant. Perfect. Yeah, that is brilliant. Do you know what? I've seen a few people before. Danny DeVito was Creed. As that, as that, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would yeah. be amazing. Yeah. So yeah, they're going to go on a, on a little romantic comedy quest across the galaxy to go and find his one true love, Margot Robbie. Incredible. Danny DeVito to me is that, remember that old guard model with the shotgun and the belly? Yeah. Yeah, I'm picturing Danny it full Danny DeVito from uh, See, It's I, Always Sunny I, I in Philadelphia. Would, yeah, yeah. I would have thought yeah. you had gone Danny DeVito for the servitor. I, that was the initial plan, but then I thought, McLovin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's... And also, Michael Sarah. And... I can't believe we've both cast Michael Sarah in our Warhammer <laughs> 40k fan cast. There you go. Yeah. I, almost, I almost put... Um, I was going to do like a, a swerve and put like Henry Cavill as a janitor at the school or something. Just <laughs> <laughs> to annoy everyone. Uh, I was initially going to do Jonah Hill with Michael Sarah. Yeah, yeah. But then I thought... That's oh, what I thought you were going to say as the guy. Well, I was going to say, but I thought that was two on the nose. Yeah, But yeah. I do love Superbad, so yeah. I threw in McLovin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd, I'd, I'd probably, watch all of them. I'd probably if watch If I'm that. honest. 
I would watch all of them. I'd, I'd watch James's purely based on it sounding insane. Um, oh, as opposed to ours that sound completely <laughs> Well, we have more compelling plots, I'll, I'll argue. Uh, well, yeah, maybe. I think well, James was a short film as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's, just, it's part of a book. It's yeah. Whole book. Yeah, he's more but, bringing... But I think if it was the whole book, if you read Vulcan Lives, then I think with those characters or those actors and... and I don't know comedians. if I could watch a three-hour film of... <laughs> Ricky oh, Gervais <laughs> talking to Chris Tucker. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've got the best bit. My director, Christopher yeah. Lloyd. Oh, yeah, that's good. And he's going to have a cameo appearance, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's good. Pretty. That's pretty, pretty good. I mean, I'm. Yeah, that's I'm pretty happy good. with that. Understood the assignment. Yeah, I, I'm just never going to look at Frankie Vaughn the same again. <laughs> that is Erebus. As Erebus, yeah, yeah. Maybe wanted, maybe wanted some like token representation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right, question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. Our question this week is, what in an army range makes you want to paint it? So I think this means specifically to like a model, like what about a model or a range or oh, a faction oh. makes you want to paint it specifically? I think the core infantry. I think because you have to paint a lot of them uh, and it's the backbone of any army that you have, your core infantry. I think that the infantry models are the things that make you fall in love with that army or that, that you should, yeah. No, what, would, just like rule of call? Cool? Like it just yeah, because can't I, quite describe it, it just appeals to you? Some people some people like an army because of the character, that's all well and good, but you can have one of those in the army, like your core infantry, your, your rank and file, like your intercessor, your sister of battle, your dark elder warrior, like your guardian, whatever. I think that's the thing that you, in my mind, you, you, you're going to paint the most of them so that should be the thing I think that or well, that is the thing that a lot of people fall in love with that yeah thing? that's like, a really good point actually I've never even thought of that like normally I do fall in love with the characters yeah and then get lumped with 16 models that I don't really like that much to paint as the yeah. infantry I think you caught your core infantry I think mm. I think for me one of the things if we're talking more about specific models rather than army ranges I think the power of the box art painting being incredible yeah, yeah can really inspire you to want to paint a character in particular so if i saw a model that even from an army that i wasn't particularly interested in or or, or something like that say these new tyranids that we were talking about last yeah, week, yeah. For, for example even a model or a reveal or something or, or i mentioned when we were talking about the nova stuff i mentioned that i loved the trogoth thing yeah yeah that's not an army that i'm particularly in love with no I'm not you know, I don't know a lot about them, but seeing that the paint job that's been done on that model was enough to like inspire me to be like, oh my God, I would love to do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that makes um, perfect so that sense. Gets it. But for me as well, in terms of actually choosing an army that you like, I actually, I've been thinking about this a lot because I've been thinking about trying to just write something about it just to get like my thoughts out and in order about it. But like, I always struggled with picking an army to be as devoted to as you are to Blood Angels, for example. Like, I always struggled because story-wise, I think one of the things I struggle with the most with Warhammer 40k is the whole everyone's a bad guy thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, that is inherently part of Warhammer 40k. Everyone is a bad guy. And I love, in terms of picking an army and picking a faction and things like that, the underdog good guy army like i just love that's the 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 well that's that's interesting why you pick tower pick, pick some tower models because i i'd argue that they're probably the i just recently picked up some yeah. pathfinder jeff kill so, team yeah i i, I get i struggle with it like I, I genuinely struggle to land on an army that i actually can be passionate about because everyone uh, there was a really good youtube video and i'm completely skipping on who uploaded it but i'll link it below if i can find it again and i really apologize to that person for completely forgetting the name but um it was a guy that did a video about how how every you know we know that every faction is is a bad guy but here's here's how every faction is a bad guy even the ones you think oh no they're the good guys here's why they're a bad guy and it's just a, a built-in thing in 40k which is for me simultaneously one of its most interesting storytelling um tools and also the one that puts me off really falling in love with a single army like even when i talk about loving dark angels i love dark angels as out of the first found in space marines like that they're 
just in terms of first founding space marines they're my favorite ones of them yeah they're not even necessarily my favorite army or i get quite bored of space marines quite easily so there's i've always just struggled to find an army that i love in that way and i think that's um i'm especially like with the cities of sigma stuff coming out i'm kind of leaning towards i could probably really fall in love with cities of sigma stuff now because the model the models are do you not think the fantasy in general would probably lean more 100% 100% yeah I think it always has but then the thing you get into is 40k mm. like that's the thing you get introduced to like mm. uh, and my friend group has never lent more towards fantasy um, I do think uh, yeah in that way I do think the answer is just well you'll find something that you love in fantasy obviously. I guess if you're not into fantasy and you prefer sci-fi that's not really a great answer though is it yeah no. but then I guess yeah. in general like, I don't know that's why I like the skirmish games as well I like the idea of kill team and stuff because I like the smaller more contained small stories because then it's less about the story of this army and yeah you could, have about, a, you could have a good guy in a band of warriors and more even about if their chapter the, is the banned. story of those individual characters i quite like that the idea of, of um of kill teams and stuff like that there's yeah. kind of that it, within it's... within heresy as well isn't there because you can play like loyalist traitor legions can't you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's just a, it's it's but then the whole argument is like even loyal well space obviously rings is not it's 40k good. like, like the, you the said the period is is sure. evil so it's like yeah it's an interesting thing like uh, i think i always struggled to fall in love with an army that way but so sometimes i can see a model and be like oh i love looks really cool i need to look more into votan actually i think votan are yeah votan could be, yeah. might float my boat and yeah. i like votan are great. they might tick the sci-fi box still and, and still be kind of something i can get passionate about but even though they're obviously not going to be good guys but it is it, it, yeah it's an interesting question really because it's one of those things i always struggle to get super passionate about but then certain models i will just look at and be like that just looks so cool I yeah that. i'm in the same boat for me it's like i've even had um army slip under the radar like i think it's just what there's no good way to describe it for me i'm not like oh if a model has this specific type of feature that makes me want to paint it. Like, i'm not really like that i think it's just like you can't really describe it. If you look at something, you just know if you think it's cool or not, right? Mm. But I've even had, I think as your tastes change, and like you said, it's easy to get bored of like Marines or whatever thing you're doing. Like for me, I never used to like um, Gene Steeler cults. That wasn't really one that appealed love, to me. I just Xenos in general, I wasn't really super into. Mm. But then like in the last couple of months, I've been like, oh, I really want to start a, a Gene Steeler cults army, mm. which is like completely rogue. And like a year ago, I wouldn't have even Kel- dreamt of that. Kel- yeah. Kelomorph model is like one of my favorite. Is that the is that the, Guns, Star? the gunslinger? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's just amazing. They've got some really cool characters. Yeah, but yeah, I think like I think it just changes, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Fair. Cool. Hobby hacks are closing tradition on the show where we share a quick little tip for you that you can incorporate into your hobby. I've got one. Yeah, I think this. I don't think people. I don't think a lot of people do this, but um, when you're applying like basin sand, basin material, mm-hmm. I don't use glue i don't use like super glue i don't use pva glue I don't, don't use glue glue. people people use like you glue. don't use glue i don't use glue what do you use i use, he uses his most powerful tool his mind, my mind. <laughs> <laughs> no i use sellotape no i don't use sellotape. um so basically i get i have a massive tub of um vallejo texture paint it's really similar to like the the gw texture paints mm-hmm. yeah, yeah it comes in a huge tub though rather than a normal little pot yeah you got to scoop it out right yeah. yeah. So I thin that down. So it's kind of a little bit watery. It's almost becomes, it's not like a paste, like how you would put it on, yeah, yeah. how it's intended to be used. I kind of thin that down a bit, um, spread that over the base and then put the base and sand on that. Because what I found is number one, it just seems to stick better. Like it keeps the sand on more than PVA glue. That I, ne- I just didn't have a good time with PVA glue doing it, to be honest. It always fell off. Mm. Um, and I also think because it's a texture paint, you get a bit more of a variety yeah, yeah. of textures because you've got the sand and the basic material that you're adding on. And even though you're thinning it down, the material, the basic material, um, it's still going to have little lumps and stuff in it. Yeah. You get a bit more variety of your kind of the sand, even on a small base, like on a bigger base, obviously you can pick and choose. So the texture paste is helping it stick to the base and then I presume you're priming over the top. As Prime well. over the top of it all. Yeah. Yeah. Prime over the top yeah. of it all and paint. Um, I just personally find it way easier to manage than I didn't have. A, 
everything was always falling off when I was using PVA glue and, and I didn't, I don't know, everyone says to use it and no one seems to have a problem with it. So I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So, um, but so I've seen people use super glue as well. I think, I've, had, I've had PVA fail on me a couple of times and I've always been able to draw it down to the fact of I tried to accelerate the drying with a hairdryer. So I, 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 I'll hopefully answer this one for you because I've had, I had initially, I've had some experiences with PVA and I've, I think I've found a solution. I always scour the base with a knife first. So I would always the base I'll use a knife and cut loads of lines and you can use sandpaper as well or use, or use it yeah but I find really sh like really going a bit heavy mm. on the base to create like almost like little foundation runs on the base quite good you obviously put PVA neat on the base yeah and then do your pull through the basic material or whatever and tidy it up around the feet around the rim etc etc but I used to always then just put PVA straight over the top the problem with that from the second coat or the coat over the top is that the PVA it is plastic when it dries, essentially. It constricts. And what it does is it, if you ha it rips the material off the base, basically. That's what I was getting. I was getting like, number one, just as much sand wouldn't stay on. Yeah. So like yeah. it would just fall off. Yeah, yeah. And number two, yeah, it kind of maybe peels up. Yeah, because what it is is that the second layer that you put on, it constricts as it dries and lifts. Pulls it up. So always when you do that second layer let it dry the pva the, the sand onto the pva and make sure you do scale the base with a knife to get those sharp sort of recessed lines and just create a bit of texture a lot of texture on the base in between the feet or whatever but do a 50 50 of pva and water and it just dilutes it down enough that it sets like concrete but it but it doesn't rip and lift the base material off the base mm. that's why i found so i do kind of like a middle ground of both of these i'll do the pva on the scuffed base and then I just go pretty heavy with the primer. Mm. I find that that, that works that also. Yeah. Out. Yeah. 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 Rattle the can other, primer. I the other, the primer. other benefit to using the, having the texture paint as part of the process as well is that it's a really, it's, I always find it easier to, if a model's got a rock on it or something, I find it easier to blend the rock into the base with a texture paint yeah, no, than works, just yeah. with sand and glue yeah. and stuff. So having that as part of the process, you can like, almost sculpt that onto the base while you're doing it yeah definitely um yeah yeah no, maybe I'd... just something for to you know people to try if they're struggling with yeah, the pva good, like i might try that good i might try that just see how it works good. Cool. Never, never used it so yeah. yeah well thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of paint perspective uh, if you could do us a favor please do rate and review us on your app of choice if you're listening to the audio version of the podcast that really really help us out uh, of course leave your comments and questions below for question of the week and we will catch you next week <laughs>